a very warm welcome to Bharata First. You're watching Big Picture. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. And since you're here, I would like to thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon, and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily Big Picture quiz. Please do participate by going through the description in the Big Picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. A small contribution you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All this information is in the description of the video. Kindly go through it. Now on to the discussion. In the middle of the worst Israel-Palestinian violence in years, India expressed deep concern at clashes in Jerusalem's Temple Mount and over eviction of Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan neighborhoods. The government also called upon both sides to not do anything to change the status quo on the ground. Meanwhile, the United States has cautiously responded to confirmation that its Middle East rival Iran has been holding rare talks with the US ally Saudi Arabia on reviving strained relations between the two neighboring regional powers. In this edition of Big Picture, we will analyze the latest developments in West Asia, what's happening between Israel and Palestine and Saudi and Iran. Joining me on the program today are Anil Trigunayat, former ambassador, KP Nayab, strategic analyst, and Harsh Panth, head strategic studies, Observer Research Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of Big Picture. Ambassador, let me start the program with you first. Let's talk about yeah. Israel and Palestine because that's been in the news at least for the last one week. It has been very hotly discussed all across the world in the media. So let's start with that and hear your thoughts on that. Well, as you know, that this is not something new. It has happened in the past and it's a nearly a 100-year-old uh, story that has been going on and more specifically from 1948. And uh, But it has changed its uh, traction now. Basically, this time what we are watching is more a fight between uh, Hamas and uh, Tel Aviv. And Hamas challenged uh, Tel Aviv basically after the Sheikh Zarra and evacuations or evictions of the properties. So the basic issue is the Palestinian issue, right? The two-state solution, whether it will ever be achieved or not. On the other hand, you have to look at it from this, uh, from the angle of the political, uh, the, some kind of a morass and both Israel and uh, Palestine. Now, Palestine did not have any elections in 2005. They were trying to come together, both Hamas as well as uh, Fatah, PLO, together and to hold elections in May. In Israel, we already have four elections and no government. Netanyahu is a hawk and he has been trying to do this kind of a thing all through and using extra force, increasing uh, settlements, creating confusion and conflict uh, with the Palestinians because that's what his style of politics is. So he doesn't want to give an inch to the uh, to the Palestinians and especially after that he has seen that the, there is no appetite in the Arab countries especially uh, to fight on behalf of the Palestine or for the Palestinian cause except for pro forma support that has been going on. So therefore today Netanyahu has seen taken this uh, approach and uh, during the Ramadan period, the kind of disputes and uh, the, the fights and skirmishes happening at the third holiest mosque, Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, uh, was something that was going to uh, take it uh, to the next level. And that's what we are seeing. And today, uh, the kind of uh, the, the Hamas has also improved and basically it's a radical organization and they don't want to give a damn about it. So they started, they threatened them and they started sending rocket fire towards Israel. Of course, uh, Israel is uh, the strongest armed force in the world and they have retaliated. And now they have deployed across uh, Gaza and they want to uh, get into the thing or basically subjugate uh, the, uh, the, the Hamas leadership totally. Already they say they have killed about eight or ten uh, uh, their generals or commanders of the Hamas uh, radical groups. Uh, the world uh, is divided, United Nations Security Council, 14 to 1, you imagine, 14 countries wanting the UN to intervene, but America has stood by them, even though Biden has spoken to Netanyahu and asking him to scale down, but Netanyahu is not listening right now because it is giving him a political traction. 
So for him, the resolution of Palestine and issue is not on the agenda, nor it is on the agenda of the Americans. Right. Mr. Nair, let me bring you in. Then. Is it all just politics being played out, uh, you know, in, in Israel at the moment? And you, we, we know that the elections, like the ambassador has pointed out, have been a problem area as far as Benjamin Netanyahu is concerned. So is this nothing but just simple politics? Well, um, Ambassador Anil Trigunayat has uh, put it uh, so succinctly that uh, I couldn't uh, agree with him more. He is uh, precisely to the point. And uh, yesterday, when Frank very kindly uh, invited me to join this program, and mentioned that Israeli-Palestine is uh, one of the issues to be uh, discussed, one segment. I uh, told him that, you know, Frank, uh, uh, my grandchildren will be, if one of them happens to be in the media and they happen to be uh, on a program like this, they will be discussing the Arab-Israeli issue and they will be saying the same things in different words, perhaps what I am, I am uh, saying today, uh, you know, uh, in the Security Council's uh, agenda, the Arab-Israeli issue is the second oldest item. The first, the oldest item is uh, Kashmir, of course, and the second oldest item is uh, Palestine. And uh, this will occur, this will repeat from uh, time to time. But uh, what is uh, cynical? as the ambassador pointed out, is that, uh, you know, uh, Netanyahu is in trouble. Uh, he is in political trouble. And uh, so the elections have been held in Israel so many times and it has been inconclusive. And uh, it's very unfortunate that in many countries, uh, politicians use uh, national security and defense in order to uh, advance their personal uh, political agenda without any consideration for the people. I mean, we saw it in uh, the United States. Uh, Donald Trump came to power uh, with this bogey of uh, people crossing from Latin America. He called Mexico names and uh, the people who are crossing over uh, the economic refugees, he called them rapists, plunderers, thieves and gangsters and all sorts of things and you know it, it found an echo in the American electorate uh, four and a half years ago and he came to power. This time he again tried to create the bogey of China. He used uh, tried to use China as, a, as an enemy but uh, it didn't work. It didn't work because uh, what <laughs> while he was trying to make an enemy of China what he repeatedly called Chinese virus got the better of him. And because of his mishandling of COVID, uh, he lost the election. So, yes, it's very cynical of uh, Netanyahu to uh, start this at, uh, at, at, at this stage. And, um, you know, it's very unfortunate that the problem defies solution. Uh, we can only hope that uh, some band-aid will be applied and then it will uh, damp down. And then, but then uh, it's very unfortunate that after a few months or after a few years, maybe next time when Netanyahu faces an election again, again, this will come up in the same context. Very unfortunate. Right. Uh, Professor, let me, bring, let me bring you in now into the picture. So, you know, you heard the other two panelists before you. So, Ms. Nair was talking about the Band-Aid. Is there going to be a Band-Aid this time around? Because it doesn't look like the other countries in West Asia, the traditional supporters of Palestine, have the appetite to do it anymore? Yes, it's always a band-aid that is applied to situations uh, like this, uh, and especially in the context of Israel-Palestine, as we have been discussing, one of the oldest disputes, uh, defying resolution, defying any sort of a concrete path even to a resolution. So we are going to see some attempts being made. We are already seeing generics being talked about, American the State Department saying that, look, uh, take both sides to, should take steps backwards to de-escalate. And I think eventually uh, de-escalation um, will happen and, and things would seem normal on the surface. But I think, you know, that there is another element here which is, which is quite interesting to perhaps uh, put out on the table, which is that at the moment uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about Biden administration's Middle East policy. 
and that is something also that all the actors you know uh, you 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 said that you'll be talking about saudis and iranians i mean everyone in the region is looking at the at biden administration and not sure where biden administration would land up if you see uh, that biden uh, by american standards took a long time in coming uh, and saying that uh, israel has a right to self defense there was a lot of discussion before uh, you know that what what is biden doing why is biden not coming out which is which is traditional american response american presidents usually come out very very soon uh, or when it when the when the crisis when these crises happen so i think clearly you know there is a there is an administration in washington that is hoping to pivot away from middle east and again that has been a hope uh, that has been a hope for a very long time now uh, mm -hmm. all of them want to pivot away from middle east but middle east comes back mm -hmm. to haunt all all presidents but if you also see where, what is interesting is that right or wrong there was a clarity in trump's approach to middle east from the very beginning from the very first day you know saying that look i'm going to do this i'm going to stand by israel I'm, and that led to a certain sets of consequences so there is you know there is a there is an interesting phase uh, people people are pointing out that look during trump administration you did see uh, on the surface stability people were actually not fighting because they knew both palestinians knew that you know they have an adversary in white house israelis knew that they have a very strong uh, supporter in white house they did not uh, you know they didn't do much and i think that clarity at the moment is missing partly because this administration is new but partly because it is de-emphasizing middle east in its foreign policy calculus so they don't have a um, they don't have an ambassador to israel which everyone is pointing out is such a big deal why by what is taking so much time so clearly there are you know i think a lot of the pieces of the puzzle in the middle east are moving looking at what washington may or may not do and therefore a lot of this is also about jostling around that position that let's take advantage of that or let's figure out how far we can push these red lines these buttons and see where we come up i mean uh, the, the escalation from uh, uh, from uh, israel the escalation from hamas there are clearly a pointers that both sides recognize this challenge and recognize this vacuum that is there in 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 global leadership and when you say global leadership in middle east you actually mean americans mm -hmm. uh, you don't there is no one else who will provide that leadership so in, in a sense uh, while we all you know while we all loath american uh, preeminence american supremacy americans all <laughs> at the end of the day only americans have the heft to do something about it so clearly the challenges are uh, you know for for both uh, palestinians and israelis enormous when you look at the biden administration and its agenda which itself is unreconciled after all you have the progressives and you have the you know the traditional democrats in the administration they are fighting it out amongst themselves uh, you have the progressives who want america to stand by human rights which means that you have to take a relatively more pro palestinian position but traditional democrat will never do that so you will have a you will have a you have a very unique set of circumstances in washington which i think are also a factor in this crisis in the escalation of this crisis maybe not the proximate cause but the way it is being played out uh because the two sides are really looking at how the the big brother is going to respond until the time you don't have a response or, or you have a muddled response i'm uh, i'm afraid i think we are going to see an escalation going forward absolutely talking about going forward let's also talk about the other development that has taken place in west asia between uh, saudi arabia and iran ambassador let's hear your thoughts on that well i think that this is a very good thing that is happening sometimes we can say it is too good to be true but it is probably driven by survival instinct <clears throat> and as professor pant said that the whether we like it or not or the world likes it or not what happens in uh, washington dc really decides the course of various actors in the region and uh, currently the, the the americans are in favor of and they have told uh, quite clearly uh, the rest of the uh, flock that uh, they would like to return to the joint comprehensive plan of action i mean that treaty and that is what is the major driving force for everyone to take some action but for the israelis everyone else whether it is saudis emiratis or others who have been put in their place and how i looked at actually uh, biden's policy in a way i don't know i may be totally wrong only time will tell what he has tried to do is he has tried to have some kind of an equanimous approach among various actors whether putting netanyahu he doesn't like netanyahu at all biden personally but they can't do anything about it because uh, of the the political this thing and jewish lobby in the region he doesn't like uh, saudis because they cast their lot totally with the uh, with the americans and kashoji issue and all these things have been brought up they don't like emiratis because the emiratis are also pushing too much in the region they hate iranians but they know the iranians are important 
in order to resolve the crisis so that they can leave the region. And that's why they're prompting everyone to work together. Why Saudis are doing it? Because Saudis are stuck in this unsolicited, undesirable war in Yemen. And they want to get out of it like the Americans want to get out of Afghanistan. So this is why they need the Iranians on the platter. And the Iranians also need it because economically, pandemic-wise or otherwise, they are in a very, very bad shape. They might say whatever it is, and they are going towards conservative. So domestically in Iran, we are seeing also that the uh, moderates, uh, led by Rouhani and Zarif and others, they are trying their last-ditch effort uh, to somehow conclude this agreement, which will show them some kind of a winner, and have good relations with the neighboring countries. And that helps them in that sense. So this is being supported. And I personally feel if the Saudis and Iranians, or the, whether it's Hormuz peace plans, or their relationship with Oman, with, uh, or they are able to control uh, these three H, which Iran has, the Houthis, uh, the Hamas, the Hezbollahs, uh, then you can see a lot of peace in the region may be predicated on it. Because Iran has the sole capacity of creating destabilization in the region. So if Iran is coming on the table and talking to Saudis, and it's too early to say that, but they have already had several talks, and I believe that um, the, uh, the Foreign Minister Zarif has been to nearly all capitals. And there are, uh, you know, Turkey is also now talking to Egypt and uh, talking to Saudi Arabia. The Foreign Minister was there, the King and Salman uh, and Erdogan have spoken. So everybody is trying to find regional solutions. With the help, if at all required, with the Iran or with the China or Russia, to some extent. So I believe that this is a good thing if it happens. Uh, I've always said that they must try to stand together because that's where their fate lies. But because of the historic reasons, Shia Sunni divide, geopolitical influence, fights, external interferences, uh, this has been defied. Israel will only come to some sense at that stage. Uh, once they see that there is some kind of a rapprochement in the Gulf itself, whether right. the Persian Gulf or the Arabic Gulf. Absolutely. Mr. Nair, so uh, is is West Asia now preparing for a period uh, without the United States? And is, is that what they are looking forward to? They're trying to find some local solutions to their problem and come out with some solutions of their own because they seem to be, uh, you know, serious this time around. At least it looks like they are. You never know what, what may happen in the near future. But the signs look good. Well, uh, that, is, that is one view. That is a credible view. But as uh, Professor Pant mentioned in uh, the earlier uh, part of the program when we were discussing the Israel-Palestinian thing, that the United States has a crucial role in that and the U.S. is at the, at the center of this. Same way in the uh, attempted Saudi-Iran rapprochement also, uh, I feel U.S. is, US is at the center of it, you know, in the sense that uh, the new Saudi uh, leadership, uh, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman, doesn't trust uh, Biden, doesn't trust the United States. Uh, the kind of things that uh, candidate Biden uh, said about Saudi Arabia uh, during the campaign, how can how can you trust him, you know? I mean, uh, the Saudis and the Americans have been allies uh, for, 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 for almost seven generations of the uh, uh, House of Saud uh, rule, you know? But suddenly you have a situation where uh, the United States cannot be trusted by the uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi leadership. And the um, Iranians in any case don't uh, trust the Americans. They, they trusted them uh, during Obama's time to some extent. And the Iranian experience has been once bitten, twice shy, you know. I mean, the Iranians uh, uh, went, went so far in uh, signing the nuclear deal, the, the uh, Joint Comprehensive Program of Action. And uh, then uh, Trump came and everything unraveled, you see. So uh, the Iranians should be very hesitant to trust the Americans again. Howsoever uh, good intentioned uh, Biden may be, and howsoever the Europeans may persuade the Iranians to uh, continue along the path of the uh, nuclear deal. So you have a situation where 
the two adversaries, the Saudis and the Iranians, uh, neither of them, neither of them trust uh, the Americans. You know, I mean, it would be too strong a term to uh, say enemies, but uh, you, uh, it, that, that, let's put it this way: there is a trust deficit in the United States, which has been the uh, uh, central power in the Gulf ever since the British withdrew. Uh, from the crucial states and the Ameri and everybody has looked up to uh, the United States uh, in, 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 in all these uh, 40, 50, 50 years almost, you know. And uh, suddenly uh, you have a situation where you have to look for uh, other options. And uh, I mean, one shouldn't forget that uh, into this situation, the Qataris are walking in, you see. The Qataris have always tried to punch above their weight. They feel that uh, uh, they are not just a regional power, they feel that they are a regional superpower, you know. Mm. That uh, they have tried to, they, they, they have in the past tried to uh, play everybody against everybody else. And uh, uh, it, uh, quite often it has come to naught. I mean, it's... Uh, in um, Syria, they had to bite dust. Then uh, it ended in their uh, isolation for several years because of the boycott by the four countries, Bahrain, Egypt, uh, uh, UAE, and uh, Saudi Arabia. But Qatar is now see a chance, you see. Uh, so uh, you may recall that uh, this whole process was started when the Qatar Emir uh, traveled secretly to Riyadh. And uh, he was, was, you know, just imagine, uh, Saudi Arabia was not even allowing Qatari planes to fly over their airspace uh, until a uh, few months ago. And uh, MBS, uh, the, the crown prince goes to the airport to receive the Qatar Emir. And he flew back the same night and then he negotiated with it. So, uh, Qatar is also trying to take advantage of, uh, of this situation. So, um, there is no vacuum yet, as far as the uh, U.S. is concerned, but uh, there is a potential vacuum or uh, a tamping down of the U.S. role, into sure. which uh, these regional powers are trying to make their own, their own arrangements to uh, some extent. Absolutely. Talking about arrangements, these arrangements between Saudi Arabia and Iran seem to be going on for a while now, Professor, because a few years ago, it was MBS himself who called uh, the supreme leader of Iran. Uh, he, he called him something to, the, something to the tune of Hitler looks like a saint in front of him or something like that is, is the statement that he made. And today they are looking at talking to each other and just in a span of two years, what has really changed? Well, you know, Frank, I think uh, you know, Middle East is one region. If if you are uh, if you are sitting uh, in in leading the uh, state in the Middle East, uh, you should be. I mean, you know, tectonic plates of global politics are shifting everywhere. But I think in Middle East, perhaps more than the other, because Middle East is used to certain kind of a. A certain kind of an artificial stability, you know, stability driven out of uh, assumption that uh, you will always have high oil prices or a stability driven from the perception of America being always, always being there. Now, if you are there, what is happening? It, you know, if, if you are if you are just uh, branching out from there and if you look at American statements, America hardly mentions Middle East. America is more concerned about Russia, China, cybersecurity, Indo-Pacific. I mean, there is <coughs> all successive administrations, last three administrations for all their uh, pre pretensions to the contrary have not really been hooked to the to the Middle East. The Middle East has a certain proclivity to come back to newspaper uh, you know headlines as we are witnessing today. But as far as American leadership is concerned, <clears throat> the message from there is quite quite distinct. And if you are if you are sitting there, if you are leading a country in the Middle East, you are worried that look this is an assumption that we were holding true. Similarly, if you look at uh, you know. Um, who is going to replace America? Now, if you, if you see Chinese going into Iran and signing a big deal there, again, there are problems with that deal, but certainly uh, Chinese are there everywhere. They have these uh, big, uh, you know, uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative projects uh, in the Middle East, and, and they are trying to project as, they are, as if they are going to be the next 
uh, country. But again, they don't have the heft, di diplomatic, political, mm -hmm. or military, to do anything substantive on the ground. Similarly, if you look, if you're looking at, in the, at the Americans, Americans one of the most important reasons Americans were there was because Americans needed Middle Eastern oil. Today, Americans don't need that. So I think if you are if you are realistic. Uh, and and if you see the if you can read the tea leaves, you'd be reading tea leaves in a certain manner that look, America eventually is going to degrade Middle East in its strategic calculus if it is not if it is not already. And therefore, how should we be prepared for that? And I think that is what we are seeing: a lot of jostling, a lot of jockeying, a lot of uh, reverting back, uh, you know, and, and sensing. I'm not so sure that this rapprochement would materialize, but I think. This is again an attempt to see, to test the waters, whether something can potentially happen. Uh, and you know, and, and we know that how uh, th this shift from Trump to Biden has been quite, uh, again, very, very significant. I mean, the Middle East has seen seismic shifts. You know, you have mm -hmm. Obama signing the nuclear deal, Trump coming in and saying nothing to do with the nuclear deal, Abraham Accords. Uh, Jerusalem being the new capital, suddenly you move to Biden, he's wishy-washy at the moment, he's trying to figure out taking some uh, portions of uh, Trump's policy, but not really saying much about other aspects. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, uh, if you are trying to work it out uh, and seeing, uh, making, trying to make sense of American policy, you're all, you're, you're, it's all over the place. So I think the best thing for them is to, is to work out some arrangements among themselves. And to see whether potentially this can be, uh, this this can uh, potentially have legs to stand on. I'm not so sure it does at the moment, given how the domestic politics, given how the regional uh, politics, and how the other aspects uh, will turn out eventually. But I think certainly this is an attempt to uh, make sure that the that they are not outwitted by a strategic game plan that someone else imposes on the region. So sometimes I think the leaders are taking making these taking these steps and make and ensuring their own space to maneuver within these uh, in these very turbulent times for everyone but particularly in the middle east absolutely all right time to get closing comments now from all my panelists with what all of this means for india starting first with you ambassador well all this is india has to be uh, in the game because it is extremely important region for us we have today bilaterally extremely good relations with nearly every country and we need to build in my view, we need to look at the possibility of what kind of a role, because see, we did not discuss China today so much. But if China really gets where it wants to within the precinct, along with Russia and the new dynamic emerges there, uh, then India will have to protect its own interest. And India is the most affected by the region. Uh, therefore, it is important that we take lead uh, and seem to be an actor which is willing to act within the region in whatever capacity possible to start with as a good interlocutor. Good interlocutor. Okay, that's the, <laughs> that, that, that's a good new word for India. Good interlocutor in West Asia and hope we can take our friendship and our goodwill to all the countries in the region. Ms. Nair? Uh, the uh, latest developments in uh, West Asia have actually hit us home. Uh, not at the policy or state level, but uh, at the human level. There was this um, Indian nurse from Kerala who got killed in the uh, in the bombs that uh, fell uh, in Israel. So, uh, unlike uh, most of the time when uh, we are distant at a human level, this time uh, it has it has it has hit hit us home, and uh, we certainly cannot uh, sit back and ignore this because. Uh, we have uh, a sizable population in Israel. The Jews from uh, Cochin and Manipur and Bombay and uh, Mumbai and all that who have taken Ailea, that is uh, the Jews when they go home, it's called Ailea to go to Israel. They are there, so, so we have an interest and uh, I am frankly a little puzzled about the uh, death of this Indian nurse because uh, I have been to Ashkelon. Where, where she lived and was killed. And Ashkelon is very heavily fortified, very heavily protected, because uh, the Israelis see uh, a, a, a continuing threat coming from Gaza. It's not new. It has been like that uh, for a very long time. And, you know, every house in Ashkelon has an underground shelter. And the moment, you know, because of the anti-missile system, when a missile leaves Gaza, 
the Israelis are alerted, the Israelis know, and everybody goes to the shelter, you know, and even their uh, bus shelters I have seen are built in such a way they, that they, 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 they are protected against these missiles. So how did this lady die? How did this nurse die? There is, there is something fishy from where we started, you know, about uh, Netanyahu uh, trying to advance his political interests. And then, you know, the mayor of Ashkelon and Netanyahu have always been at loggerheads, you know. So more than the Palestinian-Israel conflict, this is an intra-Israeli conflict in many ways, a political conflict in which cynical, unscrupulous political uh, leaders are trying to play with human lives and take advantage, advance their political careers, unfortunately. Right. And uh, Professor, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Frank, I would just say that, uh, look, uh, Middle East, I think, is going through um, some very significant changes which we have discussed. And, and I think uh, these changes are coming, you know, given the, 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 the declining footprint of the U.S. or at least the strategic interest in the region, the gro growing footprint of, the, of China, of a country like China, uh, and uh, reshaping of the internal dynamic, whether you look at Abraham Accords or whether you look at, uh, you know, the rapprochement between Saudis and the Iranians. I think, uh, you know, the, these will have some very long-term uh, consequences uh, for, of course, for the region, but also for a country like India that is so uh, entangled with, uh, you know, with the region. So I think we, should, we, we better prepare ourselves that some of the assumptions perhaps that we have grown up with may not really be suited to a to a region uh, which is uh, growing uh, which is moving away from those uh, from those realities and we should be uh, doing some amount of you know medium to long term thinking as to what how how does india prepare itself if situation changes uh, to such and such because at the moment you know we still live under this impression that look we have great relations with uh, all three pillar power centers, Israel, the Arab Gulf states, Iran, um, you know, again, whether or not it holds in operational terms, we don't know, but certainly that's the assumption we have, uh, that look, we can manage some some semblance of uh, stability, but that, you know, all uh, that, that policy frameworks works, uh, that policy framework works if you operate it under certain assumptions, uh, but if those assumptions change, then I think our approach to the region will inevitably change. Are we prepared for that? And I think that's a question all policymakers and all those who are interested in the region should be asking right now because of this, because of some of the very uh, long-term interesting developments that we are witnessing in the region uh, at the moment. All right. We'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that the issue between Israel and Palestine is a historical one without a solution in sight anytime in the near future. This time, though, it's a direct battle between Tel Aviv and Hamas, with the other players in the region staying out. The Saudi-Iran development is a positive step, much as it uh, wouldn't like to admit it, but Tehran is finding the economic pinch, and Saudi, too, is tired of fighting its regional wars. They are looking to bury the hatchet, which is a welcome move. With no clarity from the Biden administration on its Middle East policy, the countries in the region are trying to look out for their own interest. All this has a major impact on India and we have to closely watch the situation in the region because it has a direct impact on us. We need to play the role of an interlocutor whenever needed. Once again, thank you for your continued support. For those of you who haven't already subscribed, please like the video, subscribe, hit the bell icon and then all notifications. Do follow our social media handles for all the latest updates and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get some incisive content. The Bharata First team runs a daily big picture quiz. Please do participate by going through the description in the big picture videos. Here are the UPI IDs for those of you who would like to come forward and contribute. Remember, a small contribution you make will be a giant leap for us to keep bringing you this content. So do continue to show your love and support. All the information is in the description of this video. So kindly go through it whenever you can. That's it from me. See you again next time.